next up, I am more than delighted to introduce Dr. Raquel Gurr, who is a professor of psychiatry, neurology, and radiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Gurr also leads the Life Brain Institute at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Penn Medicine. She is the overall PI for the International 22Q 1.2 Brain and Behavior Consortium, and she also leads the Gene to Mental Health Network. And perhaps most importantly, Raquel um, is a world-renowned researcher and clinician in neuropsychiatry, and we petitioned her for many years to come over to the 22Q side and start seeing our patients at CHOP. And we are so delighted that she did. And, and the relationship has been inc incredibly productive um, and clinically extraordinarily useful. So passing the baton to you, Dr. Gar, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dana, and the conference organizers. You were saying that I moved to 22Q. Partly, I saw the light. It's a window of opportunity to pass the heterogeneity that relate to the genomic underpinning and the rich phenotype that is seen in complex neuropsychiatric disorders. So the context of deep phenotyping, why is it important? I think that some of the previous presentations, although not uh, coming from the genomic effort, underline the importance of uh, the heterogeneity in genomics and the lack of understanding of why with one deletion do we have such a rich phenotype. So we know the gene affects the brain and the consequent behavior dynamically during development from the intrauterine uh, environment of the fetus. And the effects are very complex and we can enhance the understanding of the phenotype with more precise measures that are applied longitudinally and measure brain and behavior and related to genomics. The aberrations that are related to 22Q deletion uh, need to be identified or uncovered in the context of examining neurotypically developing and in relation to the rich neuropsychiatic manifestations in the uh, uh, neurogenetic syndrome. Thus, 22K11.2 deletion is a unique opportunity to advance the mechanistic understanding of neuropsychiatric domains and by also providing an opportunity to probe specific behavioral domains that can be linked to brain circuitry in humans and non-humans and pursue it with more fine detail with stem cell research, for example. So the phenotyping is essential for the scaffolding that bridge between molecular processes and clinical manifestations. So when there are findings in genomics and you say, what is different between this group and this group, we will be ready to pass the heterogeneity from the phonomic end. So the integration can help us and also will help us come with, better, with novel therapeutic intervention, engage the effect of such interventions on brain and behavior. So the complex phenotypes, why are they so complex? Because the brain is complex. We will never be able to implant a brain in humans. We'll, we'll just be changing the phenotype, all we are. There are multiple interconnected regions, the multimodal parameter for measuring structure and function and mark advance in pipeline development in how we can really dissect specific brain regions, and I will illustrate. Importantly, there's protracted maturation. So if we look, for example, at schizophrenia, it doesn't present till late adolescent, early adulthood. So the critical period of brain development that need to be examined longitudinally. Behavior, likewise, of course, as a product of the brain is very complex. There are multiple behavioral domains, you can go beyond IQ and try to understand what behavioral domain and underlying circuitry are implicated, yet they're intercorrelated and the challenges of how to reduce the number of domains responsibly and how to integrate the measurement of behavioral domains with brain parameters. 
the 22 kilovan 2 deletion is a rich phenotype. There are multiple comorbidity for neuropsychiatric phenotypes. Commonly, there are lists of disorders, not one disorder. They impact multiple other organ systems. So we need to look at the heart, we need to look at endocrine function, musculoskeletal, et cetera. Important to look at it from a neurodevelopmental perspective, meaning from the get-go, and a multi-pronged approach is needed in order to advance the understanding and novel treatment. So this is a schematic, a simple presentation of the way we think about it. We need to measure trajectories of brain behavior maturation and include genome and what we now call exposome. Many of my colleagues in genetics say, well, in the environment, there are so many measures. Give us some quantifiable, replicable measures. And the science of the exposome has been increasing dramatically in human and in animal research. So if we look along the translational domains from basic translation to clinical and try to generalize to the population, we're trying to look at the interaction between exposome and genomics on brain function that in the cases of 22Q deletion can manifest a cognitive deficit, the product of brain function, and in symptoms or the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And if we look here at the maturation and we just pass it to developmental period, remember I emphasized we must look at it longitudinally and developmentally. When G and E are benign, what you have is a beautiful blue lines. And what we can say is that we can, we'd like to measure it the same way that you go to the pediatrician and say this is height, weight, at a conference to have meaningful risk parameters that rely on such measures. Under adverse E, we fall a little bit from the line. For gen genomic risk, we fall more. And when both are operating, what we see is a more marked deviance from normative function. These are individuals with subthreshold psychotic symptoms, and these are individuals with schizophrenia. And commonly, you have the interaction of G by E to manifest it. Normative population are important. All of the studies that I will describe were done in collaboration with students hospital at, on the campus at Penn, where we were able to study individuals with the deletion compared to individuals without the deletion, but otherwise from similar setting. This is the Philadelphia Neurodevelopmental Court, hence PNC. This is where we are sampling individuals, 10,000s of them, all underwent the same way that the individuals with the deletion undergo. The approach is psychiatric measurement, cognitive measures in a computerized battery that are built on functional MRI, so we know the underlying circuitry, and multimodal imaging of brain anatomy, activation functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging. All are genotyped and followed and electronic medical records are available for, for all of them. And now you can begin a journey. But you have to measure the exposome before. We developed a measure of the exposome that uh, looks at risk based on the 2010 uh, census. And now it's up upgraded to the 2020 uh, census and you can show carefully on a block by block basis all the potential adversities on a specific block in the region uh, and also show green space so you can create uh, replicable measures that are available for integration with the genomics and when we try to reduce in the normative sample first when we try to reduce the complexity or richness of the neuropsychiatric phenotype, we can come up with an overall burden, one score, and four factors generated in the 10,000 kids. Fear or phobia, anxious misery, anxiety, depression, psychosis, and externalizing behavior. And now I'm jumping to a sample from CHOP 
from Dana Center on 22Q11.2 deletion. It's a large sample. The same pattern is emerging. The point is you can move from individual with the deletion to the general population. And that's important for novel therapeutic interventions. So you have a measure of psychopathology, psychosis, externalizing behavior, ADHD, that we know is moderated by sex, more in males, and mood and anxiety that are age dependent. How are the age dependent in the sample? Many colors, I'll walk you through it. Children are in green. When you look at mood, commonly mood symptoms. When I say symptoms, I mean significant, interrupting life, function, affecting the individual with the deletion and the family. You see them emerge later on, young adulthood and adulthood, not in children. Anxiety is common across the board. ADHD, more in childhood and decreases. Psychosis prone, subthreshold symptoms. I call it a psychosis touch. They are not fully psychotic. You see more in adolescents. You see it less in our young sample of adults. And you see more emerging in adulthood. This is one sample, loud sample here. The IBBC that was referred to before has provided an opportunity to show a very similar pattern across 22 sites. So if we look by age from six to 12, et cetera, up to uh, older than, uh, you know, closer to the forties, you see that psychosis features emerge later in development, the blue and are less evident in young people. So this buttresses the replicability in the pattern that is global. Are the sex differences, we know there are sex differences, are the sex differences in 22Q11.2? We see them in anxiety, more in females. The sample is young, and that's why it's not significant uh, for mood. Most of them are pre-adolescent. We see it for anxiety, we see it for ADHD, more in males, psychosis, risk, we see it more in males, but less when they become adult, there are no sex differences, which has been replicated in multiple samples. So when we look at psychosis spectrum, we see that they're quite common in the sample. And like in the general population, in the common space studies, what we see is initially negative symptoms, lack of engagement, lack of initiation. Later on, pre-adolescent and adolescent, positive symptoms emerge and a relatively a small, a small portion of the individual develop psychotic uh, threshold symptoms that meet diagnostic criteria. Importantly, among the rare CMVs, 22Q is the most marked increase in schizophrenia. But still, I tell parents, Am my kid going to develop schizophrenia? I said, fortunately, most of them will not, but we can follow the development longitudinally. So the similarities between idiopathic schizophrenia in the subthreshold symptoms, when they emerge, when do they pass to psychosis uh, disorder, the profile of the symptoms and outcomes. The unique features to 22Q because it's a unique syndrome and unique individuals. So they have more cognitive deficit, they have less tolerance to normal stress, and ADHD is higher. Fortunately, there's less substance use, and substance, substances are no m and they can induce psychosis. This is not the case in the syndrome. So now I'm moving to the other part of cognitive, and this does illustrate to you the computer games we have created on the, on the basis of functional MRI and individuals as young as seven with the deletion can engage and look at it, we present it as a game and they are fully engaged. And what do we see in large samples like that, age eight to 21? The red, these are Z-scores, these are the normative samples. These are multiple domains across domains is that individuals with the deletion are of cognitive impairment. This is at one time, it's not longitudinal. They are more impaired 
that individuals with developmental delay without medical comorbidity and those with medical comorbidity. Speed-wise, they go fast, except for domains of emotional identification, social cognition. And these kids with more impairment in social cognition are more likely to have subthreshold psychotic symptoms and autism spectrum symptoms. And we have heard today on the allelic over representation of rare variants that impacts these, these uh, clinical neuropsychiatric syndromes. So if we have to probe, we can go at all the domains, how they go developmentally from healthy kids, kids with the 22Q and kids with developmental de delay, if we choose to translate to animal work, it's social cognition. And there are many rodent paradigms that look at social interaction. And this is the most impaired in addition to complex cognition that is less one factor. Here you can measure it and it's a good link to, be, uh, to basic science. Early language development is important, is a busy slide. I will just orient you. Blue, no psychotic symptoms. Green, sub-threshold psychotic symptoms or threshold. These are kids who were evaluated the job before we ever met them, that standard language evaluation. What you can see here is that the kids with sub-threshold psychotic symptoms over time show decline in language, whereas the kids who have no sub-threshold psychotic symptoms show age expected improvement. This suggests that early measures of language are important for intervention. And indeed, this is replicated, extended in the IBBC, where individuals with the deletion followed longitudinally for verbal IQ, those who be show decline were more likely to develop psychosis later on. So the decline in verbal IQ preceded. Language is an important domain for trying to predict a psychosis and early intervention. The integration of 22Q looking at polygenic risk score for schizophrenia that has been published in the literature, you can see that the 22Q deletion adds to the positive prediction value for schizophrenia. In other words, in addition to the known established in the general population, it's at the risk. Similarly, for lower IQ, it adds, uh, increases risk compared to the general population. Brain anatomy is critical. It can be visible. This is individuals, we, we know that for non-deleted individuals with schizophrenia, there is failure of closure of the symptom pellucidum, commonly closes within the membrane closes within the second year of life. In individual, these individuals from our sample fail to close and they have more psychotic symptoms. And you can look at multiple brain parameters, volume, thickness, cortical thickness, surface area, gerification. Individual with the deletion, when compared to controls, no typical development, show aberrations on these multiple measures. Connectivity in the brain between typically developing across lobes is impaired. And if now you look at the IBBC sample that at imaging, you know, the collaboration increased also imaging, you can see that those with psychotic symptoms, with psychotic symptoms have a distinct pattern compared to those without psychotic symptoms. And it's similar to what is seen in schizophrenia in the general population. An important er uh, brain structure that has been studied in schizophrenia, but up to recently, not in 22Q syndrome, is the cerebellum. And here we have studied the cerebellum, Eric Schmidt in our group, and in collaboration with CHOP, and we see that cerebellar volume is decreased, 
And if we control for brain volume, we can still see that individual with the deletion of a decrease. And it's not across the entire, the unique lobules that are important, not just for coordination, but for cognition. And these are studied in a mouse model as well. Just to show how the functional MRI for an emotion test, because remember I showed you that emotion identification linked to social cognition is impaired. You can pass it apart with a advanced method of uh, imaging. And it shows that the visual cortex in individuals with the deletion is not impaired. They're able and insular function are not impaired, but face processing and emotional memory are uniquely impaired. Just to illustrate how we can relate the Philadelphia neurodevelopmental cohort data on psychopathology domains, environment, brain parameters, and cognition, we are looking here at the burden of CMVs, overall burden of CMVs. And what we see is that they relate to cognition, specific domains of cognition, and to overall psychopathology, especially psychosis, as I shown before. And if we now look at the polygenic score and the neighborhood, we can again see that overall accuracy of performance and specific domains, such as the cognitive, memory, and the social, are more impaired with an adverse environment. So we can see that, and that overall psychopathology is more impaired with an adverse environment. And you can model the brain parameters as well. So this is high risk, increased burden for psychopathology. What we see in them is more deviance from the normative than in those with a low rare CMV burden. So overall, the syndrome provides or we are born individuals with a syndrome with a genomic variability. On it is epigenomics or prenatally that can be evaluated, the intrauterine exposome. And with this perinatal stress, the early exposome during adolescence increases the risk and with some a small proportion, but it provides guidelines for measurement, for translation, and for looking at IPSC on informative phenomic groups. For example, as is done at Stanford, it's done at uh, Chopin, is looking at those who develop schizophrenia and those who do not develop schizophrenia, the work of uh, Stuart Anderson. This work would have never been done without very close collaboration from the 22Q Center and collaborators at CHOP, without the Brain Behavior Laboratory, and without uh, the support of the families that have enabled us really to be now virtually in the living rooms to continue the research, NIMH, the Daoshan Family Fund, and the Life and Brain Institute. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Raquel. Really a tour de force presentation and uh, so interesting. I know that we're a little bit over time and we don't want to run into our break, but we had a really important question early on and I, and I wonder if each of our speakers could speak to it. So Quinn Bradley posed the question, is there any way we can inject the missing piece or proteins of 22Q and 1.2 deletion so that the missing section of the cell can be filled? Dr. Gerber, since you're up, why don't we start with you and then maybe we can hear from our other speakers. So, I mean, that it's, it's, it's the dream that the progress that we will be able to make, I'm not sure the injection, but it's going to be what is done now uh, in several neurological uh, uh, disorder where we can use gene therapy. Um, I hope, I certainly hope so. I was inspired by some of the progress in, uh, by uh, the molecular colleagues. So we are trying to prepare the phenotype and tell you what here is a group 
that we might want to start with. Thank you, Raquel. And Bernice, from an embryologic perspective, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think it's difficult from an embryo at this moment, but you know, the future is going to things, everything changes, right? Um, but I do think that some of the outcomes of embryo, embryonic problems might be able to be fixed. And Dr. Sudoff or Dr. Scambler, any comments? Yeah, I, I guess just going on the embryological angle. I mean, basically, uh, the defects are really in play almost at the same time as the woman realizes she's pregnant. So then you'd be faced with, you know, if, even if you could cure this somehow in the future, then how are you going to do the trials? What about the ethics? Are you really going to start squirting stuff into, um, you, you know, a woman as, as soon as her um, gonadotrophin hormone is, is up, if she happens to have a, a, a deletion or what uh, is everyone going to have, how are you going to tell there's a deletion there at that stage anyway? Are you going to give everybody, um, you know, um, PCD or something? To, I don't think you are. So I, I think it will be late embryonic to fetal uh, things that may be amenable um, uh, to treatment. And, you know, even if some of the neur neurological things are kind of almost hardwired, during development, there's still the case for that hard wiring affecting a final common pathway, still amenable to um, the small molecules. You know, it, it, uh, that a lot of people are investigating rather than the gene replacement itself. So, so that's what I was thinking, Pete, you know, targeting those pathways, in particular in, in those individuals who, as Raquel mentioned, are at most risk, because we know, for instance, from Bernice and your work, that congenital heart disease is not 100%, and the brain phenotype is not 100%. So we don't want to target somebody who wasn't ever going to have the problem, right? Um, one other quick question before we go off for the break. Uh, Raquel Ann Lawler from Ireland asks, would you agree that school is very often an adverse environment for children with 22Q1.2 deletion syndrome? Hmm. I think that uh, from listening to the parents and the kids, uh, for some of them, unfortunately, yes. And the parents need to, uh, you know, input in getting the best setting uh, that fits the kids' uh, needs. Some, yes, I'll say it can be, unfortunately. Well, I would just like to thank our speakers again. I think we should stop here and have our five-minute break. Come back on time and in, in at one fifteen. Eastern time, and you can do the math wherever you are. And next up will be genomics, which will also be very exciting to follow on this session. So thank you all again, and uh, I, we hope to see you in Croatia.